Welcome back, everyone, to this week's episode of the Comp Effect Podcast. I am thrilled to have a guest speaker on today who has done some really exciting work in the, uh, the mental health and COVID space. Uh, today, we have Ruben Roberts, who is the CEO of RER Consulting. And one of the coolest things that he did that we're going to talk about on today's podcast is how he created a program for Miami-Dade County, um, really to navigate the myriad of challenges that COVID-19 presented uh, with the pandemic and the myriad of health-related and mental health-related issues that accompany a pandemic. Um, his program targeted all 2.8 million Miami-Dade residents, but also focused additional resources on those residents living in hard to reach and marginalized communities. And today's message here is we'll talk a little bit about that and then maybe how your business can use Ruben's experience and knowledge and what he learned from that, uh, that program on how to safely bring people back into your business or your office or your workforce as our pandemic winds down. So Ruben, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Todd. We're happy to have you here. Um, for those of you listening, I called him Mr. Roberts earlier, and he reminded me that name was for his father, not for him. And so <laughs> we're going to be pretty friendly on today's podcast. But uh, Ruben, happy to have you here. Appreciate you taking the time today. And um, let's just let's just get right into it, man. What um, You've done a lot of cool things. You serve on a lot of organizations. Um, I see your name all over the place when I start searching LinkedIn and Google and the social media platform. Can you just give us a, a few minutes about your background and the organizations you're involved in and all the things that you do? Uh, I don't think I could do it in a minute, but I'll do. I'll try my best. Take as much time. <laughs> well, first and foremost, I am uh, Ruben Roberts. I am the uh, CEO and founder of RER Consulting. Uh, we are a, a consulting firm that works with uh, governmental entities in terms of project development, project management. Also, we do trainings, um, workshops, seminars, and so on and so forth. I, uh, uh, my, my career path, I, I am a family therapist by trade. I worked uh, for the University of Miami for over 18 years uh, as a family therapist in a model uh, that where we develop a model of family therapy called Brief Strategic Family Therapy. So I have a very uh, systemic mindset when I'm doing the work that I do, which plays a part in, in actually the project that we just worked on in terms of the uh, COVID-19 mental health and wellness program. I am the immediate past president of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. I sit on various boards, too many, to, too numerous to name. Uh, um, and I, um, I uh, definitely consult uh, wherever needed, uh, again, with county or uh, local government entities, state entities as well. So just to, in, a, in a brief nutshell, I wanted to really give you the condensed version of a, a little bit of my background. I was born in the Bahamas, uh, but raised here in the United States. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a husband, a father, and, um, and I love what I do. <laughs> well, I think it shows. I think it shows with the passion that you have. Uh, so give us a little bit of uh, where did the idea come from to create a program specifically for Miami-Dade County when the pandemic hit? So I want to say this, that um, we started in Miami as a pilot, uh, but we are definitely looking to uh, expand uh, in other cities, other counties. Uh, we have the, the bandwidth to do so. Uh, but we are definitely looking to, to do that. Uh, to answer your question, how this started, I had a conversation with a very close friend and my wife uh, regarding, um, you know, just the effects of COVID on just mental health, on folks' mental health. This was happening around February uh, before the shutdown. January, late uh, February, late January, February before the shutdown. By the time April came about, uh, my friend had encouraged me to, Ruben, just put something down on, on in writing, put a proposal together. And I did, we submitted the proposal um, to address the issues and concerns that I saw happening from a systemic level. Uh, you know, there was so much uncertainty. 
about the future. We had no vaccine um, around. We didn't know exactly how to treat the, the, this, this virus. This, and um, we didn't know, you know, how, how, who can contract it, how it was gonna be contracted. It was a lot of information forthcoming and it was really stressing folks out, you know? And so as we went on and uh, I developed more of the, along with uh, the partners, developed more of the uh, a concept of the COVID-19 mental health and wellness program. Uh, we submitted a proposal to Miami-Dade County uh, uh, for mental health. There was nothing out there. They were all thinking about, all of the entities uh, were thinking about, you know, how do we provide food for those who are not working? They were thinking about finding uh, 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 mortgage and rent moratoriums. They were thinking about, um, they were thinking about a host of other issues. The number one issue that was not addressed initially was the mental health issue. And so, uh, of course, when we submitted our proposal, folks thought it was a great idea and uh, subsequently we were funded. And so what, from, what I, from what I read online, some of that funding came through the CARES Act? Yeah, it came from the CARES Act. So did the CARES Act provide that funding nationwide and you just had the, had the vision to do that in Miami-Dade County, but this could have been done. I mean, had anybody had taken the, the initiative, this could have been done in Chicago or LA or anywhere. Right, so most of the municipalities, the CARES Act was funded to the local municipalities and to the states. Yep. And so uh, most of the municipalities were looking at how they can sustain their families. Uh, yep. When they were talking about sustaining their families, again, they were looking at how for families who uh, weren't able to receive or earn income, how they can you know, feed those families, how they can house those families and that sort of thing. Uh, but I think that what happened, so the majority of those programs that I saw were really looking at how they can sustain those families. But the element of mental health uh, was not front and center uh, during the time. I think it's becoming more and more apparent that that's something that uh, we need to be considering. And I see more of an initiative to, to address mental health right now. I would agree. I see. I think that a lot of people have mental exhaustion. I yes. think between the pandemic and the election and just everything you see. Yes. Like I, I, I'm just exhausted. Like it's been overload for 12 months, right? Just everything coming at you. And I'm mentally exhausted from half the stuff that I just see. You have to even include the social justice movement that happened during the yeah. time, the protest, all of that. So imagine we're in the middle of a pandemic. We got this George Floyd thing. The, there's this huge social justice movement going on. You know, there are just so many, your emotions are just all over the place, regardless of what your position is, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of emotions that's going on. There's so much uncertainty about the future. So what, what do you do? How do you handle this? You know, there were a lot of uh, restless night. The, and then the election, the, the presidential election, again, regardless of what side you're on or who you believe in, you know, again, these, all of those factors, it was a confluence. It was like a, a, a perfect storm that just, you know, came into play. Yeah. And, uh, you know, folks were just in, in, in uh, a, a lot of emotional turmoil. And this is the time where, you know, your mental psyche is really being tested. And if you don't have the resources or if you don't have access to resources to really help you, you know, process and, and handle and, and assess what's going on, it can be extremely challenging for you. So walk me through, walk me through Ruben. You get your program passed in Miami-Dade County through the CARES Act. What were the, what, what were your objectives? What were you, what were you hoping to learn and hoping to solve? <clears throat> so the first thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that we could assess where people were in terms of COVID-19, you know, from a mental health perspective. So we developed a survey. Our survey uh, the main constructs for those surveys, the survey was about anxiety, stress, levels of support, and depression. And then once we uh, were able to assess where they were, the, the, the unique part about our survey, and this is something that you don't generally see with surveys. Surveys are just generally questionnaires where they give 
they you they receive information from you, but they don't usually give information back to uh, the person that's taking the survey. Well, with our survey, you received a scorecard, and you had the zero to ten range. And on that scorecard, it will tell you the level of severity in those categories that I described to you just a moment ago. And if you were ranging high in those or on in those one of those categories, we didn't just want to get tell you, hey, you're you know based on your your score. You know, you, you seem to be depressed or you seem to be overly anxious yeah. or that sort of thing. So we partnered with a mental health uh, entity called New Horizons uh, here in Miami. And with New Horizons, we had a, what we called a, uh, a team, but we called it a care coordination team. And what they would do is we, uh, they, would, uh, they, would, they would respond to folks who wanted to receive services. So now you know that there's a stigma, especially in marginalized communities, there are stigmas about uh, receiving mental health. Um, I think that stigma they, prevails everywhere. I mean, yeah, generally does. speaking, it may be worse in marginalized It may yeah, be worse it may in marginalized be, communities, it, but yeah. It may be a little bit worse, but yeah, I agree. Mental health, there's a stigma across the board, but you know, uh, for those of us in the field, anyone, um, anyone could be diagnosed out of the DSM-5 right now with some sort of mental health issue, okay? And that's the thing that we have to really recognize and find a way to normalize this whole thing about folks deal with stressors and some of it's situational and some of it is, is more severe. But anyway, uh, because of the HIPAA guidelines, we wanted to, we didn't want to just, uh, we couldn't just get the, the, the folks who fill out the um, survey, their information. So it was all blind. We, we got no uh, data other than demographic data from them. But we gave them an opportunity if they wanted to receive services to email us their, their contact information. And then one of our care coordination team members would contact them after they received their scorecard. And with that uh, done, the, 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 um, the uh, care coordination team member would uh, and then do a brief assessment and, and then refer the, uh, the, the person to services. So the services could be uh, mental health services. Uh, they do a brief consult uh, and then refer them to services. It could be mental health uh, services or it could be environmental services, uh, such as you know, finding uh, food, finding shelter, finding you know, uh, employment, that sort of thing. Whatever the stressors that may be that they're dealing with. Uh, in addition to uh, that care coordination team, we also partnered with a local university, Bar Barry University. And Barry U University did an educational, uh, they did educational modules. Um, the educational modules really helped to uh, deal with sharing information about COVID and how to cope uh, during this time of COVID from when we were dealing with um, experts in the mental health field and uh, medical field. Uh, so we gave them updates about what was going on in, in the area with COVID. We gave them coping strategies and the four modules about how to deal with some of the stressors, depression, and so on. How to identify family members who may be stressed out or depressed and, and then, you know, let them know what the symptoms may be. And so those things were all done. And get this, we did it with a cultural and linguistic model in mind. So we did it in all three prominent languages here in Miami-Dade County, which is English, Spanish, and Creole. Uh, all, of our, all of our collateral was done in all three languages as well. So uh, folks who wanted to um, access that, we wanted to make sure that everyone had access. And the key for us was about having access. And we wanted to make sure that everyone had access to those services. Uh, for those of you who, who would like to, to visit the website, we still have the website up, but the survey is not there now. Uh, the survey, the website is mymentalhealthmiami.com. And so you can go there and you'll see some of the other resources and list of resources and, and get a feel for what we provided. We had a hotline number. So you had a hotline number you can call in on, and then we had a 24-hour the uh, number as well. The uh, hotline number gave you access to the care coordination team. Um, the surveys were there. We had on the uh, website uh, resource page for those folks who were reticent about um, calling in to the uh, care coordination team. So we wanted to address this issue for all folks, folks who 
who may have a little concerns or about uh, being uh, uh, associated with mental health issues, mm -hmm. they could watch the modules and still get some help. And hopefully the modules would uh, encourage them to go out and, and seek some professional help. Some of them may not have wanted to go through our program, but maybe they would go to their own personal physicians if they had them uh, for referral services or linking them up. But we gave folks in Miami-Dade County that information and we only had three months to do it in. And we served over, uh, we served over 4,500 people in those three months, in that three month period of time. So, okay. So you create a website, My Mental Health Miami. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing you probably threw up some billboards, some Facebook marketing, some, some type of advertising to drive people to that website. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So they drive them there, they get a scorecard. They then take that scorecard. If they choose, they can go on for a second level of, of care through your coordination team. Right. At no cost to them? No cost, none of this was cost. It was paid through the CARES Act. So there was no cost to anyone that wanted to participate in. The mental health is, is serious. And we wanted to eliminate all of the blocks and barriers to people accessing services, definitely. Our, 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 our part, there was no cost. There may have been some costs in terms of who they partnered with, who we, uh, agencies that we referred them to, but we made sure that whoever we partnered with uh, offered sliding scale fees. So if you didn't have an income, a low, low income, then, you know, the cost is very minimal, if not at all. Nice. Um, so you directly out of, I think I heard you say you helped 4,500 people directly yes. through the care coordination team. Yes, I'm, I'm guessing you probably had way more visitors to your website and way oh. more like, <laughs> yes, well, you have to understand this was just a three month period of time. Yeah. So I mean, that they're there. Um, I mean, yes, we had a lot more activity uh, than that. But again, understand that uh, folks had the opportunity to engage us. Uh, because we wanted to be respectful uh, and definitely follow the HIPAA laws as well. So, yep. yeah. Is there still, is there money in the CARES program in 2021 that's unused if private sector businesses or additional public sector businesses want to do this? I think that there is monies available uh, because the program was extended uh, until December of this year. Okay. Uh, but I believe that the local governments have already earmarked those dollars. But there are new dollars that are coming in through the American Rescue uh, Act, uh, that sort of thing. So you have plenty of opportunities uh, uh, for different programs. And then there's definitely, uh, you, know, uh, you know, funding that may be available through the states or through uh, local government and other, uh, other areas as well. Okay. So now that the program is over, what uh, what generalizations can you make? What what did you see, and what do you think you helped change? Well, the thing that we saw uh, was when you look at the mental health outcomes across the demographics that we dealt with, we saw that uh, that uh, in terms of gender, you know, there was uh, uh, there were there were a higher number of females. Uh, with symptoms of uh, depression, anxiety, uh, and, um, and, and for the males, the stress levels were higher uh, in terms of stress. And, um, and what we saw in terms of eth ethnicity, uh, we saw that there was a, a, a higher number of symptoms of depression among whites. Um, um, and stress level uh, among whites. And then secondly, the stress level with black people uh, were there and then Hispanics followed. Uh, fear of COVID, we saw that there were a higher number of stress, uh, of fear of COVID among white folks that took the survey and then followed by uh, black and then Hispanic when we, when we break it down from a cultural perspective. And then the anxiety, uh, there was a high level of anxiety uh, again, among white folks, uh, and then there's uh, Hispanic and then African-American. From a workforce, a work status, what we saw was that uh, the folks that participated in our survey 
uh, there were about 10% um, of the participants that were unemployed, 10.11% okay. um, or laid off. And then there were uh, about, um, there were about 10% uh, 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 laid off due to COVID-19. And then uh, uh, there were about 12% uh, that were working part-time uh, due to COVID. Uh, and then there were uh, about 8% uh, that were working part-time prior to COVID. And then we had about 7% that were working full-time. Overall, what we discovered in terms of the mental health and wellness uh, of, 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 of uh, the folks that took the assessment, we found out that, um, we found out that, that with, that, they, that there were, again, uh, high, high levels of stress uh, amongst uh, the members that, 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 um, that we, that we uh, assessed. We found out that folks were definitely unsure about their future and then that folks were uh, very concerned about uh, how they were gonna make ends meet or uh, how they were gonna take care of themselves. So one of the things that we uh, saw is that the environmental impact uh, had definitely played a, a very severe part in the mental health of folks that we assess. And then <clears throat> we, we realized that uh, the folks who were, um, who were scoring higher in levels of anxiety and levels of depression were uh, reluctant to seek services. So this is another issue in terms of the workforce. Um, when you have folks who are internalizing all of this uh, mental health issues, but they're not looking to really uh, seek the services uh, for that they need mm -hmm. to address some of their concerns. So to me, one of the things that really stood out uh, as far as the work that we did was how do we access, uh, how do we, how do we, um, how do we engage, how do we motivate folks who are really, uh, in some cases, uh, being debilitated uh, by this whole pandemic? How do we engage them to seek the services that they, they need to bring them back on course? You, you follow me? So right now you see this whole push about uh, after the act passed, you know, well, folks don't want to go to work because they're getting an extra $300 a week or whatever that is. I hear that nonstop. <laughs> you can't survive on extra $300. What happens is that folks who are able to work from home, you know, they, they can't understand why someone else doesn't want to go back out into the workforce, why they don't want to go back out there in all of this area of uncertainty, right? but they have not taken into account the mental health and how they are being impacted by the mental health about what's going on with their family members. Folks have lost family members. We've dealt with several folks who did the surveys that lost several family members, not just one. And sometimes in the span of two or three weeks. And so one of the things you have to look at is that has an impact on you. You don't have an uh, opportunity to grieve or, uh, or mourn. Imagine you, you know, you you uh, have a grandparent or an elderly person, and you couldn't even be in the room with them on their last days. Uh, imagine what that feels like in terms of the guilt, uh, in terms of just the depression that you can have behind that, or the anxiety. Uh, so there's a lot that's related to. Uh, what's going on. But what we found was that the, 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 the distress levels and the high levels, I mean, and the depression levels and, and, and such were very high among the folks that we, um, that we surveyed. And we felt that there was, we surveyed them and we, we uh, offered them an opportunity to receive uh, treatment. We would have liked to see more uh, people to receive treatment, but we feel that the stigma behind mental health has definitely um, hindered a lot of folks uh, from um, accessing services. And so that's why we did the modules to really educate people uh, to make sure that even if they, 
didn't want to go to a mental health provider, but they will be able to uh, get um, some sort of information that may eventually encourage them. So overall, uh, I, I feel that uh, the key is to me is to really work on engaging people, normalizing the sense of, of mental health, that, that issues like stressors and, and depression are not, are not uncommon among folks during difficult times, uh, you know, like, like a pandemic, and then really making sure that we get people uh, services that they need. So from an outsider, I would say, I mean, the results of your findings don't surprise me. I mean, it's pretty easy to see that people are stressed out and have high anxiety, right? Right. So the real question I have is, so you're, you get the results from that study that confirms probably what people are thinking, but now you have the actual data that says, hey, right. here's what we thought. This is the truth. That was, you did that, what, fourth quarter of 2020? Right. All right. So we're recording this podcast in May. I bet if they funded that again, you still see probably similar results, do you think? I think you're going to see similar results. I think that what you're going to see, though, I mean, to do a continuation, we would like to delve a little bit deeper. Okay. So the, one, of the, one of the challenges of uh, doing surveys is that you have, you have the sweet spot, right? You, I mean, if we wanted to do, I mean, I come from a research environment from the University of Miami. I would do a three-hour battery, you know, <laughs> try to get as much data Nobody's as I got possibly time for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> right? So folks are not going to be interested in that. So the, we had a propitious niche where we had to dwindle our survey down to yeah. about 10 minutes or so, you know, and that was pushing it. And as well, and, TikTok and, has my attention span down to 15 seconds now. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. But in order for us to really <laughs> gather the data that we need, so now we need to look at the reintegration piece. Uh, you know, people how they're how they're factoring in. We need to look at the grieving piece a little bit more. You know, okay. folks who've had those losses and that sort of thing. There's other there's other pieces that we now. I don't want to give it all away, but there's other pieces that we need to look into in terms of uh, furthering the study. We are looking at right now on a state level and on a local level uh, and um, across the nation, looking at how we can uh, utilize the program that we have and then also looking at how we can tailor make uh, programs that are similar in terms of what uh, local governments or state governments may need uh, to uh, address uh, some of the concerns um, that they have in terms of the integration of the, of the workforce. One key area that we really need to look at is that these kids who've been out of school for over a year, when those kids, when we not only the reintegration of the workforce, but you need to look at reintegrating students into the classroom and staff back into the classroom and how that's gonna impact. So some of these kids, especially very early on, kindergarten's first, second, third grade, in terms of their socialization skills, yep. you know, how has that impacted them, you know, being out for so long and, and only socializing with relatives or that sort of thing. And so one of the things that we have to look at is really assessing for that and then coming up with some strategies that we can deal with uh, coping strategies and helping to reintegrate these uh, students back into uh, the school system. Not so much concerned about the uh, older students, but definitely on the primary elementary uh, level, I think that this is gonna be key in terms of what we need to be doing right there. Do you know who um, uh, the author Malcolm Gladwell is? Malcolm? Malcolm Gladwell, he um, uh, wrote the book, The Outliers. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, what yes. you talk about is exactly what I worry about. Cause in that book, he talked, one of the things he talks about is the difference, as I recall, between maybe uh, uh, rich kids versus poor kids. And yes. Rich kids versus poor kids during the school year, poor kids go in the summer and they find jobs. Rich kids go with their parents and they go to museums and they never stop learning. Right. And so the gap between June and September when the kids come back, the, the richer kids came back at a higher level on those initial assessments than when they left the school year at the, you know, the, the prior three months, because they never stopped learning. They read books, they continued to grow, um, where some of the, the poor kids did not. Back to your point, I wonder what a year of pandemic does globally. I mean, because I would think that the whole system would be depressed 
just from a year of less interaction, high stress, high anxiety. I mean, it's hard to learn remote under all those situations. And I think right, right. And the other part of the rich kid and the poor kid thing is think about this: in a rich family, you may have more square footage in your home and less people in your home, and so you you have freedoms. I mean, I have friends that you know that I know who are very well off. They 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 have a room. Uh, for when you went out into the world, you can come in and derobe and, and take a shower before you went into the house. Yep. And then I have friends who have very little space available. You know, folks are on top of each other. So when they went out and came back in, there was no special room to go into. Uh, so everyone, you know, and, you know, they were interacting with each other in, in very close quarters on a regular basis. And if you look at that for about a year and a half, and then uh, for folks who are, they're used to living in this home, but they're, they're, they're used to people being gone during the day. Now you're there 24 seven, <laughs> you know, if there's six or seven people in a, in a 1200 square foot home, you're there all day. And so that really wears on your nerves, that really wears on everything about you. So yeah, there, there's that dynamic between, in terms of the wealth gap and, uh, and just, just being able to have a you know, comfortable space and uh, being able to have your personal space and, and so on and so forth. All of those are factors in terms of how you're uh, dealing with this pandemic and how it has impacted you and your family, you know? So we got off topic here, but that was a let, let's let's okay. segue back I'm in, sorry. right? Because, no, this <laughs> is this is great information here. Um, so I occasionally when I look down, I take notes here. Um, if I have to recap what you told me that you learned from your Miami Dade County program, um, females were more likely to experience depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. men were more likely to be high stressed, right? And then I, I didn't have the statistics, but it your study had shown that the way people were affected, whether in your community, I think you used um, white, Spanish, uh, what were the three different categories that you, you. So we use white, Spanish and, and black. And, okay. and, and even in those categories, right? So when, even within black, uh, there are different categories like you, you have, even though we lump them together, but you have a Caribbean community, you know, you have a large Haitian community, you have a large Jamaican community here in South Florida. So we didn't break it down that far, but we used it based on uh, uh, race uh, as far as those things are concerned. And so there, there are definitely some other, again, we could have explored a little bit more, uh, but we were limited in terms of making sure that we have um, uh, a survey that folks would feel comfortable filling out in a very brief period of time. So do you think the pandemic then, um, well, I, I, I believe you do. Uh, maybe you just tell us here. What, uh, how do you think the pandemic affected whites, uh, Hispanics and blacks differently? So I, I think that depending on, I think it was more about um, your, your socioeconomic status. So I think that folks who were and, 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 and largely entry level jobs, um, you know, uh, you know, were largely, they were largely uh, minority populations, Hispanic blacks, that sort of thing. And so those folks were really stressed out uh, because they were frontline workers required to come in and do some work and that sort of thing. And then you had some folks who were on the, on the um, um, uh, moderate to moderate high. So you had uh, folks like firefighters, police officers and so on uh, that were uh, on the front lines as well, but it was a little bit different. They had more protective gear. Uh, they were you know, better protected in terms of interacting with folks. But these frontline workers who worked in the restaurant, worked in you know, any type of service industry, uh, those folks who were uh, putting themselves in harm's way. And a lot of times initially they didn't have all of the protective gear uh, they, they seem to have higher stress levels, uh, and, and, um, uh, and those were generally, uh, the, um, the, uh, black and Hispanics. Uh, I think that the, 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 uh, the thing that was telling, and I, and I can't, I mean, we have to, 
explore it a little bit more. As I mentioned to you before, in terms of the symptoms of anxiety, for example, uh, with white folks, uh, and the symptom, uh, the the symptoms, uh, the the uh, fear of COVID, and 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 then the stress levels. I believe that um, uh, anecdotally that this dealt with more of um, financial security or insecurity about what was going on, uh, not so much uh, the environmental factors that the the, uh, the the more marginalized folks, not saying that they weren't, weren't as concerned about those other factors, uh, but I believe it was more of the, the um, based on uh, the data that I saw, uh, more about the financial stressors or the uncertainty about what they're you know their futures in, in terms of maintaining their lifestyle and sure. and and and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But for the marginalized community, it was more about just being able to, uh, again, just be able to take care of the basic necessities. I think that that was more of a concern for them more than anything else when it when it dealt with that, regardless of race. Uh, if you were a white person that 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 uh, considered marginalized in terms of being in that lower socioeconomic status, yep. uh, that, that would be a same that would be a similar issue for you as well as uh, someone who is, uh, you know, in in, in uh, of a different race. Got it. So, with your knowledge, I think this is a perfect segue. Uh, you've got some great data here, and I think there's a lot of. There's a lot of companies right now that are questioning, how do we bring people back to work? Um, how do we bring people back to work safely? Uh, restaurants are slowly opening up. Um, the restaurants that are open in Iowa, they're, they're having a heck of a time finding people that wanna come back to work right now. Um, the construction industry, they don't have enough truck drivers to drive products around. Uh, I mean, we, I hear that there's nobody, I hear that nobody can find workers right now. Everybody seems to be short staffed. The people, the, the, the fast food restaurant that I stopped in to work the other day, they had an, it was really neat. They had a nice, they had a nice sign taped up that says, please be nice to our staff. These are the people that showed up to work today. Mm -hmm. And just to recognize the positive. Um, so I'm wondering based upon your knowledge, should businesses have different paths on how they bring people back to work? I mean, so Definitely. many times we're taught, hey, one program, here's our program, but I don't think that we should have one program based upon what you're telling me. Definitely. In addition to our COVID-19 mental health and wellness program, we've also developed a workforce reintegration program. And I think that it's important, vitally important for any uh, business to really assess uh, for where their staff uh, needs are and where they are mentally uh, prior to them coming back into the workforce. Uh, so you have, like I said before, folks who are still grieving and have not received any type of, of bereavement counseling or that sort of thing. You have folks who are dealing with major financial issues. So folks who are, are who have not paid rent in over four or five months or haven't paid their mortgage in over four or five months. And, you know, all of that's going to come due at the, at the end of the mor moratorium or maybe it's due now. And so they have no idea of how they're going to make those ends meet, how they're going to house their families and that sort of thing. You have folks who have not been covered in terms of insurance because of being laid off, who have, um, who have uh, uh, major disorders where they require medication and that sort of thing. So they may not have been taking their medication uh, as needed. Uh, so there's so many issues uh, that you have to, to address and assess for uh, prior to them coming back in. You have folks who are, are have families, family members, elderly family members who need uh, need to be cared for during the day. And then they also have children who need to be cared for during the day. Remember schools have not fully opened. The schools just ended, school year just ended. So you're saying, come on back, but now I have no place for my, my, my youth to go. Summer programs haven't really geared up right now, that sort of thing. Everything has been closed. So the workforce reintegration program addresses these issues in terms of assessing, and then it helps to give guidance to the entity to figure out, okay, how can we help uh, serve, you know, our staff? It's not only 
uh, it's not about folks receiving an extra $300 in terms of stimulus or a $1,600 stimulus check. That really doesn't go far. There are other environmental factors. There are other uh, factors that are involved that folks have to negotiate. And once we have those things in place, once we can assess for those things, then you'll, you'll, we'll be able to better address it. You may have to look at staff. You have some staff who want to come in and work full time. They're ready to come in the office for 40 hours a week or more. And then you have some staff who may need a little bit of flexibility, who need, you need to be able to work partially at home and then partially in, in the uh, work environment if, you're, if, if the job uh, allows them uh, to do so. So those are the things that we really need to look into in terms of uh, how do you re reintegrate these folks back into the workforce? And, um, and, and mind you, for those of you who are working on, uh, you know, jobs where uh, safety issues are, are, are at concern, if you're not fully there mentally, you're really more at risk of having an accident or, you know, uh, going into, uh, you know, having some sort of issue on the job where it can cause some sort of problem, whether it's a spill or an accident, if you're dealing with the, um, if you're dealing with a forklift or whatever the case may be. So this is one of the reasons why I would behoove um, uh, businesses to really do the assessment and come up with a reintegration, re re workforce reintegration plan for their staff so that they can better be prepared. And, and, and as I said to you earlier, this pandemic, as we know, is, is, is there are different strands. And according to the research, you know, there, there, there are more that's coming. So this is something that you need to have for the long term. It's not a, it's not a one and done. This pandemic, uh, although we seem to be coming out of this, it's not over. We need to be able to be prepared to deal with these things in the future as well. And so we need to put some plans in place so that we can definitely uh, be, be better prepared to serve our staff and our customers. I think what you're saying, Ruben, uh, I hope, I hope businesses are listening to this, uh, you know, actively. This is new. I, I think this is new ground for a lot of businesses. I mean, yes. we, we talk about mental health maybe as a side effect of a work comp claim or many businesses will provide a, Hey, we have a mental health program as part of our, uh, long-term disability program, you can call and get a free phone counseling. But th I think there's a new world out here. I talked to a friend of mine the other day and he tells me that there's a meatpacking facility in a large town that he works with that normally on any given day, they have 300 people that will show up to work. Lately, they're getting 30 people to show up. Wow. Th these are people that they're just not coming to work. And either they're not coming to work, maybe because of some of the things that you mentioned before, mental health, family, caring, they're mentally exhausted. They may want to work, but their mind just maybe, maybe says, I can't work today. I can't work this close to another person, or I don't like doing this type of stuff. Um, I think we need to start coming at things from a new way and talking about that. And I think you, you, uh, you said it best when you have a workplace or workforce reintegration plan. And that's something that your consulting business has created and, and sells to businesses all over the country. Yes. Yes. Okay. And we can tailor it for whatever industry. So it's not like a one size fit all, you know, we go in, we assess, and then we develop the actual, uh, questionnaires. And then we will, based on the data that we receive, uh, have a report with our recommendations in terms of what's needed. In terms How long of, something like that take? Uh, depends on the size of the company. Uh, so, it, you know, it's not, again, it's not a one size fit all, uh, but it depends on the size of the company and the staff uh, levels. And uh, we can definitely work with something, but I think that for most uh, mid-sized uh, companies, uh, um, you, you're looking at something with uh, two or 300 staff members. We can probably do something like that in three months. If you're talking about in the thousands, it may take, you know, uh, a year or six months to, to do that. Do you think businesses have three months to a year? No, for the workforce, uh, for the workforce uh, reintegration piece, uh, yeah. it's going to be different, uh, difficult uh, for a business for that. But what we can do is we can target different areas. So we don't have to deal with administrators. 
we can deal with direct line staff and that can cut down the numbers and that sort of thing. And then we can we can get to the administrators later. But just to be reasonable in terms of the data and, and, and we can probably with my research team, we can probably cut that time down. But I know that there are some uh, systems out there that are extremely large. I don't want to uh, um, uh, over promise and under deliver. But gotcha. definitely a six month period of time is probably uh, for for those very large establishments is is a time frame that we can probably go uh, at the at the high end, but I'm sure we can probably do something much sooner. Ruben, there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers out there. People, maybe smaller companies that maybe 50 or less that don't have the resources that are trying to bring people back, and they may try and do something like this on their own. And uh, it's like me when I do construction, I'm going to screw it up every single time until I have to bring in a professional. What uh, what advice would you give for the do-it-yourself company that may try to do their own mental health reintegration act or bring people back? What what may be the first misstep that they may make or how are they gonna get it wrong? Well, I can't, I'm not gonna focus on how they can get it wrong, but I'm gonna tell you how you get it right. And okay, how you let's get it do right that. is uh, really communicating with your staff. Uh, you really have to just sit down, talk with your staff, find out what their needs are, uh, find out, uh, you know, what's going on with them. That means that you have to have a good relationship with your staff, you know? Uh, sometimes it's good for a third party to do that. Uh, but if you, if you, you know, don't have the resources, uh, I think that that's the first thing that you need to do is really uh, just have a, a, a brief conversation with your staff members, find out what's going on, find out what the, you know, if there are any stressors that are there, uh, what's going on with them as far as that, find out if they had any recent losses in their family or significant losses in their family, find out if they have fear of losing something now, like their home or uh, car or whatever it is that they may be. Uh, in need of for them to uh, to to get to work or do their job effectively, and so that's something I would encourage them to do. But the communication piece is very very important. I think you're, if you have an HR department, they should have some skill set in that, how to do that, um, and and make sure that they just start on start there. That's that's the place to start. Once you gather the information, then you can start looking at what kind of plans you can put in place. Good, I like that. All right. Well, um, I think we're running about out of time here, aren't we? I'm pushing up against the hour. Um, what's next for you? Well, again, like I shared with you, we're going to be working, we're working on right now, securing funding for the continuation of the COVID mental health and night uh, wellness okay. program. We're looking also to do some other uh, uh, work uh, uh, on a state level uh, in the uh, state of Florida. Uh, to, to, to address some mental health concerns and concerns about healthcare disparities in general. Uh, and then uh, there's, some, there's a couple other projects, but right now we're still in this space with mental health uh, and healthcare disparities and really looking for solutions on how we can get folks, uh, like I said, the major thing for me is getting folks access to services or re really reducing those stigmas uh, that folks have about mental health services and really getting them connected to the services that they need so that they can uh, they can get the proper treatment. Ruben, appreciate you and all you do. I think uh, I think Florida is in good hands. Thank you. Um, anything else you want to talk about today? If not, I got a couple questions for you. Uh, I, I think we pretty much covered. I just want to encourage everyone to you know to come and visit our our website. As I mentioned to you before, the if you I think you have the information you're going to put online, yep. but to go to mymentalhealthmiami.com. Uh, uh, you can also go to uh, 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 RER Consulting at www.rerconsulting.com. Um, make sure that um, you get plugged in. Any any company that wants to uh, wants to develop a, a workforce reintegration plan, any company that wants to do anything regarding uh, the assessments for the mental health and wellness program, or any state or local government, we're, we're here. We're accessible. We'll work with you, and we'll tell and make a program to suit your needs. So these are the things that I want to make sure that we do. We need to make sure that we get. Uh, our country and our members together, our, uh, our, our workforce together, and we are on the path to wellness. 
That's the key. On the pathway to mental health wellness. I hope we're on that path. I really do. I hope we can all come together and I hope we can. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. Let's get through this. Let's get the, let's get the pandemic behind us. Let's get our workers yes. back to work. Let's care about everybody. And I think make the world a better place, right? Right. All right. So question for you, Ruben, what are you reading right now? Um, right now I'm reading uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. How to Be an Anti-Racist by, by Ebert Kennedy? Yeah, Kendi, Kendi, K-E-N-D-I. K-E-N-D-I, K-E-N-D-I. Is that a new book? Uh, it's, it's, uh, about, uh, uh, a year, a year and some change. Okay. We'll have to check that one out. And then, uh, as we wind down the pandemic, what have you found out that you're spending more money on than you should? <laughs> well, if you look at my house right now, you'll see we, we are doing some serious remodeling right now. That's okay. why everything is all over the place. Uh, and so I've, I've been spending a lot more money with home improvements and surprisingly, uh, Home Depot, I mean, there's never since the pandemic, I've never seen an empty aisle in Home Depot. So I think there are a lot of others that are doing the same thing. I think you're hundred percent right. And then Ruben, as we wrap up again today, once again, um, appreciate you appreciate the work that you've done. Appreciate you coming on the podcast today and sharing your experience and your knowledge with us and our listeners. And then as we wrap up today, you get to take uh, a minute and just pass along any message you would like to, to wish our, that our listeners can wish, wish them well. Anything that you want anybody to hear? Sure. So I just want to encourage you all to really take the time to really um, just do a self check in make sure that you do a mental health and wellness check-in with family and friends. If you've been separated due to the, the pandemic, if you haven't had access, if you are afraid to go and, and, and meet someone face-to-face, -face, you know, use social media, use the phone, make sure you check in on folks. There are a lot of folks that are dealing with a, uh, a lot of issues in terms of mental health. We didn't cover much today, but suicide is also an issue. And so when you have isolation, when you have people that are, um, that have not had contacts with others, uh, that is something that definitely can play a part in, uh, you know, of suicide. So we need to make sure that we check in. Make sure you do your own self check. Uh, you know when you're kind of off, you know when you're not yourself. And if, 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 if you feel that you're off and you, you feel like you're not yourself, seek some professional uh, help. See if you can find someone, a counselor or a therapist or a psychiatrist, someone that you can talk to to seek the type of uh, help that you need. The mental health is important. Uh, if, you get, if, you, if, you're, if you're in a good place in the mental space, then everything else will fall right in line. So I just wanna share that with you. Encourage you all again to just be safe. Uh, uh, definitely do the self-care. And if there's anything that, uh, that I could do for you, please reach out. Uh, you have my contact information and we'll be, we'll be more than happy to help serve you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ruben. Thank you.